Hello everyone, I am Lahari Desai and this is a lecture on inflammatory lesions of the jaws. The learning outcomes would be to understand the disease mechanism in the jaws and to describe the general radiographic features of inflammatory lesions. So when we're talking about inflammatory lesions, primarily all of them are sequelae of dental caries or trauma to the tooth structure. So this is a diagrammatic representation of the interrelationship of possible results of periapical inflammation. Uh, you must understand that um, <clears throat> the etiology of pulpitis of a tooth can either be caries or trauma, uh, apart from the various other reasons that can inflame the pulp. These are the primary two important reasons where you have um, where can you can have a necrotic pulp. This then leads to apical periodontitis, which can further lead to periapical inflammatory disease. Now, when we're talking about inflammatory disease, you could have a periapical granuloma, which could lead to a cyst or can be interchangeable with a periapical abscess. Or upon progression, both of these can lead to osteomyelitis. So this is the um, natural progression of the disease process uh, that happens after the pulp is uh, necrotized and leads to periapical inflammation. Let's start off with the simplest periapical inflammation that we see uh, in the oral cavity when initially the caries or inflammatory pathogens progress to involve the lamina dura and the break open the sorry in inflame the periodontal ligament space alone and next beyond that inflame the lamina dura. So what happens at the apex of the tooth is we see this initial widening of the PDL space and this is called as chronic apical periodontitis. It must be remembered here that in an acute situation uh, radiographic changes are less likely evident and hence and um, when the patient is absolutely symptomatic with the just a um, few days history of apical periodontitis, it's very less likely that you are going to see a widened PDL, but more likely when it is a chronic apical periodontitis and the inflammatory um, uh, changes are evident as a widened PDL uh, <clears throat> space as well as a thickened lamina dura. Moving on, uh, we're talking about a periapical granuloma where the inflammation is uh, visible in the form of a well-defined radiolucency at the apex of the tooth which is pulpally involved. Here you can see in this lateral incisor there is a, a well-defined radiolucency with a very thick um, sclerotic margin. Similarly in the molar here also a periapical granuloma seen at the apex. So uh, it must be understood here that on a radiograph it is very difficult to differentiate between a periapical granuloma and a small periapical uh, cyst. However, a larger periapical cyst can, uh, anything larger than 1 cm is definitely a periapical cyst. Something which is smaller than 1 cm in diameter should be either a granuloma or a periapical cyst. However, periapical granulomas are more often found in the apex of the teeth uh, of, as an inflammatory um, phenomenon. Moving on to a cyst, this image in the first picture here shows us a large cystic area about a little over 1 by 1 cm on both sides bilaterally involving the apices of both the central and lateral incisors bilaterally. So I uh, must remind you here that a periapical cyst generally has a well-defined sclerotic margin and the <coughs> epicenter would be the root apex of the tooth which is the offending tooth. Now on the image that you're seeing on your uh, right side is that of a root stump leading to a large periapical cyst and uh, this picture here I often uh, remind my students always that even if there is a very small superficial uh, harmless looking root stump it's important to take a radiograph for this particular reason. So if a radiograph is not taken prior to extraction uh, you could have missed a large periapical cyst which would be left behind inside the bone without being irrigated or without being uh, um, uh, cleared out and uh, which, which could lead to a future residual cyst in the area and making the area um, difficult in future for either placing uh, prosthodontic rehabilitation or uh, perhaps an implant.
Periapical abscess, on the other hand, is a more ill-defined radiolucency. It must be understood that there could be varying degree of uh, bone loss that happens in an abscess. And again, let me remind you here that only chronic lesions are very clearly visible to the naked eye as a radiolucency in the bone. That means that there must be sufficient, sufficient amount of loss in trabecular bone uh, and resorption in the bone for our naked eye to be able to see changes uh, which appear as a radiolucency. If you notice here in the, both the pictures, there are radiolucent areas. You're able to see an ill-defined radiolucency as the apex of the mesial root of the uh, molar, as well as radiolucency at the apex of the um, premolar also. So now both of these are mixed radio-opaque radiolucent areas. Whereas the one in the incisors is also ill-defined, margins do not have a definite boundary or sclerotic margin and is considerably more radiolucent, indicating that perhaps the destruction of bone is much larger compared to the other areas where the bone destruction is um, intermixed with bone formation. Rarifying ostitis is a purely radiologic term which is used to indicate the appearance of radiolucency. Again, ill-defined at the apex of a tooth that is periapically involved. Uh, generally, the tooth would be non-vital, the pulp is non-vital, caries or trauma and very similar in appearance to an abscess. Uh, you, must be, you must understand that rarifying ostitis is a purely radiology term. It <clears throat> Again, like I mentioned, um, there is ill-defined radiolucency depending on, upon how much amount of uh, bone destruction has happened. Uh, you would be able to see a mixed radio-opaque radiolucent appearance at the apex of the tooth. Uh, this is an image showing you both rarifying ostitis as well as uh, sclerosing or condensing ostitis. Uh, the term sclerosing or condensing ostitis can be used interchangeably. So um, the term rarifying is used when you're having a um, more radiolucent appearance. But if there is a more radio-opaque appearance, then the term condensing ostitis is used. Now, we must remember uh, at the very outset that bone reacts to inflammation by either bone formation or bone destruction. So when there is more bone formation as a reaction to inflammation, it would result in more bone being laid down and this is called as condensing ostitis. But when there is bone loss that happens as a result of inflammation, there is loss of bone structure and this would lead to the appearance of rarifying ostitis. So it is very common to have a central region of rarefaction. The term rarefaction means radiolucency surrounded by a periphery of radio-opaque um, a sclerosis. So this is a typical picture of the center showing radiolucency and the periphery showing radio opacity. So whichever appears more widely uh, involved, for example, in the first image, the opacification is larger than the lucency, then we would call it as condensing ostitis. But if the radiolucency is larger than the opacification, then you would want to call it as rarefying ostitis. But at the end of the day essentially both teeth would require endodontic treatment or extraction. Uh, another picture showing you the same thing again. Uh, rarifying ostitis, remember, is the terminology used when there is more amount of rarefaction or radiolucency, more bone loss. Condensing ostitis or sclerosing ostitis, on the other hand, is the terminology used when there is more bone formation as a result of uh, bone deposition happening as a result of inflammation. Now, when we have to talk about differential interpretation, in the other words, it is the differential diagnosis on a radio radiographic image. Uh, this is a very common uh, differential diagnosis, which is the periapical cemento-osseous dysplasia, also called as periapical cemental dysplasia. So in this radiograph, you can see both the incisors are having ill-defined radiolucencies, but the most important difference that you would remember here is that the tooth would be vital. On a radiograph, they appear very similar to rarifying ostitis. So they form the best differential diagnosis for rarifying ostitis. <laughs>
a differential interpretation for condensing osteitis would be dense bone islands. Um, these are, uh, are seen um, as idiopathic uh, areas of sclerosis and do not require any treatment. In comparison to sclerosing osteitis or condensing osteitis, the PDL space is uniform in width and you will see that there is no pulp, pulp involvement. Endoperio lesion would be discussed in detail in another uh, in the perio chapter but I just want to mention here is that generally when a tooth is endodontically involved as well as periodontically involved the radiolucency at some point uh, of the endodontic radiolucency as well as the periodontic radiolucency caused by bone loss they mix and merge with each other forming a larger radiolucency the terminology used would be called as an endoperio lesion. Periostitis is a new bone formation um, emanating from the floor of the maxillary sinus that is seen here in this particular picture as a result of adjacent areas of uh, rarefying ostitis. So both the images here are showing us the maxillary premolars which are roots which are very close to the maxillary sinus floor. So as a result of an inflammatory reaction happening at the apex of the premolar, what happens is that the mucosa and the lining, periosteal lining, that is the thin lining of bone on the floor of the maxillary sinus also gets inflamed and this bone there is more bone formation that happens here and in some cases you could have mild mucositis as well uh, this reaction is called as a periostitis very commonly seen in the maxillary premolar and molar regions Periapical scar is the term given to a fibrous scar after successful um, orthograde or retrograde endodontic treatment. Uh, this is specifically a in cases of episectomy where uh, the apex of the tooth has been uh, treated following root canal treatment in cases of um, periapical uh, lesions which were treated uh, orthograde uh, or through a retrograde endodontic treatment so uh, that area eventually heals uh, the tooth is now um, not infectious anymore but the bone pattern that forms after a result of this uh, minor surgical procedure is called as a periapical scar and it is evident on radiographs for a long time and in some patients it might remain like that for a very long time um, without much bone remodeling happening there Let's move on to osteomyelitis, which is virtually uh, almost the end of the sequelae of the dental caries that we had just seen. Uh, the acute phases of osteomyelitis to chronic phases of osteomyelitis have different radiographic appearances, but it must be understood that there is a larger area of involvement in comparison to a periapical abscess or um, rarefying or condensing osteitis. So there is a new bone formation as well as dead bone that is seen in osteomyelitis. This, these images here show you mixed radio-opaque radio-lucent uh, appearance and, and these radio-opaque areas are sequestra which may develop and these can be identified by closely inspecting a region of bone resorption uh, for an island of radio-opaque bone internally so you can see these islands of radio opacity within a large radiolucency which is a typical appearance of osteomyelitis similarly you can see uh, the enlargement of uh, bone at the periphery of this uh, uh, on, on this occlusal view uh, moving on with osteomyelitis, the typical appearance is called as a moth-eaten appearance. Uh, again, the black and the white arrow marks are pointing out towards uh, uh, <clears throat> involucrum and sequestra, which are there in the giving it an appearance of a moth-eaten appearance, a classical example of osteomyelitis. Proliferative periostitis, um, also referred to as Gary's osteomyelitis, has an onion skin-like appearance. This is uh, acute osteomyelitis that can stimulate either bone resorption or bone formation. The onion skin pattern of periosteal new bone formation can appear as a series of one or more pairs of alternating radiolucent and radiopaque bands or lines 
oriented parallel or slightly convex to the surface of the bone um, because of a periosteal reaction. So what happens is that the osteomyelitis that you can see, this is a CT image as well as a plain radiographic image. You can see layers of radiolucency and radioopacity and this specifically appears like an onion skin. And this proliferative periostitis is generally seen in younger individuals and is indicative of new bone as well as older bone which occurs in uh, pairs. Uh, moving on to osteoradionecrosis, this happens in patients who have undergone uh, dental treatment or a traumatic uh, a dental episode in a bone that has already been previously irradiated. That means subjected to radiotherapy. So post radiotherapy in the head and neck region, the uh, bone is generally very um, susceptible to injury and hence all extractions and invasive dental procedures uh, must be postponed for about um, <clears throat> a few weeks after radiotherapy and uh, imaging also of the area should only be done after a uh, few weeks to months after uh, radiotherapy is given to the uh, jaw area. Otherwise, it can result in a non-healing osteomyelitis of the bone where the bone is porous and of uh, inflammatory uh, area called as osteoradionecrosis. You can see in the image here that the bone is exposed and is an extremely painful condition and uh, can be quite difficult to treat as well. So, um, so much so that the patient could have pathologic fracture of the bone and um, it can happen in, uh, especially in the lower mandible region where the bone is quite thin and this is an example where the bone has progressed from, uh, due to resorption in a case of osteoradionecrosis uh, where the lesion has progressed to cause fracture of the bone within a period of three months. Another term that is very important when we're talking about inflammatory lesions of the jaws is medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaws. Very similar in appearance to osteomyelitis or osteoradionecrosis, uh, but the causative agent is generally bisphosphonate therapy, um, which is taken as a therapy for um, osteoporosis. You would see here the patient's pictures, which are about a few years apart, uh, where this one at uh, the first is a before for the medication therapy and after the therapy you can see multiple areas of mixed radiolucent radio opaque areas indicating that the bone has undergone osteonecrosis. Uh, like I have mentioned before, the treatment of osteonecrosis or medicated medication related osteonecrosis of the jaws uh, can be quite complicated. Um, in literature has proven that uh, both surgical and uh, interventions as well as hyperbaric oxygen therapy have only limited effect and they have not been consistently successful. So prevention is a mainstay of therapy. Patients who've been scheduled to be administered uh, the drugs intravenously should have a dental examination to remove all potential and real sources of infection to obviate the need for invasive dental procedures in future. And that is very important to all future dentists to keep in mind that uh, uh, multiple medications uh, which patients are taking could cause um, this sort of um, osteonecrosis, especially uh, bisphosphonate therapy. The situation is further complicated by the fact that the half-life of some of these drugs in the bone can be as long as 12 years. And once bone is exposed, management is aimed at controlling the symptoms of pain and infection with antibiotic mouth rinses and uh, systemic antibiotic therapy. So that brings me to an end of this uh, topic on inflammatory lesions. Uh, more from the references that I have used here primarily is Vitamin Farrow, Oral Radiology. I would want you to go through it and kindly email me should you have any other doubts. Thank you.